Hi, this is Caroline Hamilton, and I'm going to be your presenter today. Again, uh, thank you very much for coming, and we're just going to go ahead and get started. This is me, Caroline Hamilton, and I've been doing this for a really long time, and I actually like doing it, and I like doing something about active shooters. I'm really tired of it, so I'm hoping that we're going to be able to, to get past that soon and be able to control this a little better. So it turns out that worry about an active shooter is the number one issue that keeps management up at night. COOs, CEOs, all these, that's the thing that they worry about the most. So the first thing we ask when we go in to do a risk assessment and look at the chance that you could have some kind of an incident was you look to see what your threat profile is. So we want to see how many, what the crime level is where you are. We have those numbers down to the zip code thanks to the FBI. And now we're dealing with new things, flooding, extreme heat, tornadoes, hurricanes. And I just saw, because my brother still lives in Southern California, that they're going to get a year's worth of rain in the next 24 hours in Orange County, California. And they live in Irvine right off of, right off of the ocean. But sexual assault, theft, lawsuits, wrongful death lawsuits, a huge driver of this whole thing. And of course, this trend toward uh, domestic extremism. So one of the things that you, why we do risk assessments to start with is to look and see what are the most current threats now. Maybe they weren't the threats before, but they are now. So like the Kentucky, where they had 35 people, 45 people killed in those floods and never had a flood there before. So now that gets put into their profile. So now you realize that you have to protect against that too, besides all these other things that you're worried about. So I thought it would be sort of fun to look and see what your uh, uniform crime index score is uh, they, from the FBI. So Parkland, Florida, this is where I live, right next to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, where they had the bad school shooting. It's a 77 out of 100. And that means that only 23% of the U.S. is safer than Parkland. Washington, D.C., which I know Eric's familiar with, is five, five out of 100. That means 95% of, percent of cities in the U.S. are safer than Washington, D.C. Uh, Boston, in Massachusetts. This is screwed up, but it's 19. So that means that 81 of the U.S. of the cities in the U.S. are safer than Boston, Massachusetts. Beverly Hills, California, which you think would be great, is a seven. And that means 93% of the United States is safer than Beverly Hills. And then we'll go into the, the middle of the country, very conservative territory, Boise, Idaho, where I have a lot of friends at St. Luke's there, is a 30. And that means 70% of the United States is safer. And I didn't pick these for the numbers. I just randomly picked a couple cities I thought in different parts of the country would be interesting. And there's the result. So your crime index, we, in fact, I active shoot a presentation to a group in upstate New York, and they were so shocked when they found out their crime rate was five out of a hundred. They thought they were like completely safe. They had no idea. And I was there for three days. And the third day, they were still asking me, people were coming up and asking me about where they got that number. So if you want to get that number, just let me know and I'll, for your city, and I'll be happy to calculate it for you and send it back to you. So the domestic terrorism is playing into all this. This is the advisory that was put out in, on June 7th of this year. And we had this really active period of all these things happening June, July, August, continuing in September. So uh, if you, I, what I would ask everybody to do is to, to read this and then to take, take this link that I'm giving you and send it out to all of your staff and say that maybe they missed it. You want them to know that this June 7th domestic terrorism advisory is still in effect because it still is. These are some of the latest things that's happening. So if I look at it, I realize how shocked I was when I found out about the Columbine shooting. That was like one of the worst things I've ever experienced. There's a whole bunch of others, of course, that came and I know exactly where I was, where everything happened. But this just shows you. So the trend is that nobody, everybody hates this and everybody should try to stop it but that nobody's doing anything to stop it. That's why it's so much worse today than it was in 2001. Some some of the judges are, and I think uh, some politicians even are getting fed up with the amount of violence. So this is uh, from August 3rd. The Texas judge orders Spectrum Cable and their parent company, Charter Communications, to pay more than $7 billion in damages. And it was a family, it's to the family of an 83-year-old grandmother who was stabbed to death in her home by the cable guy. And he, he came to her house to install her system in his uniform. He murdered her. He saw she had money and credit cards hanging out all over the place. So he went back the next day with his uniform and went on a shopping spree. The murder took place in 2019. The verdict was announced this week. And what they found was that they were grossly, Charter Communications, a parent company, which owns all these spectrum places, was grossly negligent in the death, citing systemic failures throughout the company. Prosecutors said that he lied about his work history, but Spectrum never guaranteed, never verified his employment records. They didn't check the fact that he had potential red flag 
looks like felonies. They didn't even do a, a search on his name, and they were completely ignoring all those all those indicators. And they even charged the family fifty eight dollars for the service call, and then the jury awarded them the the family three hundred and seventy five million dollars in compensatory damages. And then they said that Charter, the parent company, has to pay 90% of that. And when they announced the verdict, the judge announced Charter's going to pay an additional $7 billion to the Thomas family. So that's $7,375,000,000 overnight to somebody. Unbelievable. And they said the jury in this case was thoughtful and attentive to the evidence. This verdict justly reflects the extensive evidence regarding the nature of the harm called by Charter Spectrum's gross negligence and reckless misconduct for the safety of the American public. We can only hope that Charter Spectrum and its shareholders are listening. And so this is what's going to change, I think, all this, is the fact that these lawsuits are so enormous. This one 84-year-old, 83-year-old grandmother who probably lived a very frugal life and now was worth to the family seven over $7 billion. That that's what I think is going to change things. So for hospitals specifically, this is something sort of amazing. And these are my risk alerts, by the way, that I send out. And Eric, I know Eric gets them and Bert gets them. But if you want to get them, you can just write me a note on my email address on the last slide and uh, tell me you'd like them and I'll put you on the list so you can get them too. So this was a nurse and a paramedic stabbed and left with serious injuries in Missouri at the SSM Health DePaul Hospital. And what's interesting about this, the nurses said that the hospital leaders had repeatedly ignored their pleas to increase security at the hospital, including they wanted more security staff. They wanted to add the concealed weapon metal detectors that we're going to talk about to prevent all these workplace violence incidents. And one of the nurses even said that it's 100% preventable. When you're working at DePaul, you're literally walking down the halls looking over your shoulder. So what happened here? A 30-year-old lady was arrested. She took uh, uh, in her purse she took a knife. She took the knife out in the emergency room and started stabbing people. So she hurt a nurse uh, really badly. I think she died later. The nurse stabbed in the back and the neck. She heard somebody say she has a knife and looked up and the lady was just stabbing everybody she could reach. The nurses union came up and said, hey, we for years we've been asking for this. They haven't done anything, hadn't spent any money on it at all. Frequent instances of patients physically and verbally assaulting employees. They had all the warnings they, should po they could possibly need. And they found the knife at the scene. They said it's unconscionable, but it happens every day there. In fact, one of my clients up in upstate New York told me that one of the people at this hospital had applied to a job there and they, they hired him because he couldn't stand the violence anymore. So he moved from Missouri to upstate New York. Pretty incredible. Now, this is the second part of why I put this in because I'm sure this happens a lot of places. This is a press release that came out the week later. The spokesman for SSM DePaul Hospital, Ryan Perkins, said that they'd been looking at this for a long time and they just they're just adding a metal detector to the emergency department and they took several months conducting an extensive system-wide evaluation of our physical environments, while also seeking input from team members who participate in our workplace violence committees. And so based on this, he said, this just came to them, right? They hadn't done anything all these years. And all of a sudden they have one stabbing and now they're increasing hospital security one week later. These are some of the uh, active shooter incidents that happened in the United States in 2020, 2021, and 2021. And so this just shows you how many they had. In 2020, they had 40 in 19 states. In 2021, they had 60 in 30 states. So it's a big increase. How many casualties did they have? They had 164 in 2020. They had 243 in 2021. And so this just drives me crazy. It's every single year I do these webinars and I talk to people about this and I do training and all this stuff and every year it gets worse. So you would think logically, I would think logically that, you know, if you keep talking about it and drilling people and CMS requires you to do two drills a year and you have to have active shooter training, all this stuff, you would think that these might have stayed the same for one year or got, but they're going completely in the wrong direction. So it's getting worse every single year and it doesn't matter what the government says. The only thing I think is going to slow this down is those law, those huge wrongful death lawsuits. Because obviously policies and procedures, nobody pays any attention to, you know, even the federal ones, people don't pay any attention to. So it's just, it's a very sad situation. It's getting worse and nobody's listening. So I, I hope you're going to listen to me today. In 2020, we had one law enforcement officer killed. In 2021, we had two. And this, again, it has to do with how many people challenge the shooters, like in the Uvalde school shooting that we just had, had the webinar on that. And none of the, they had 376 law enforcement officers within 12 inches of the classroom door. Nobody opened the door. They could hear the gunshots going off, but nobody wanted to open the door and take a chance on getting hurt themselves. And so I can see that in law enforcement, especially as a lot of these ones that I did today, the kid got two assault rifles for his birthday. 
a 17 year old, 18 year old to assault rifles for his birthday. Ridiculous. So we need to, to have some fun, some changes about how uh, holding people accountable and having appropriate age limits on some of these. And uh, so this just, again, how many of these incidents in the last in the last year met the mass killing definition, which is four more injured and uh, or killed. Five of them did in 2020 and 12 did in 2021. How many incidents were they engaged the shooter? Eight in 2020, 17 in 2021. The gender of the shooter, again, 35 were male out of 42 incidents. And in 2021, 6 60 out of 16 out of 61 incidents again still not a lot of use of body armor the shooters committed suicide usually if they're over 55 they commit suicide if they're under 55 they turn themselves in and so these are just showing you how this is still just escalating escalating so what factors are at work here the revenue problems that in the past it prevented hospitals from putting in needed controls. They have this disturbing, it can't happen here mentality. I had somebody tell me that someplace up in uh, West Virginia where they have shootings every single week said, well, we'd never have a big shooting here. You know, it never happened here. That's what they said in Uvalde. That's what I heard on the news. I saw it, the, the sheriff saying, you know, this is a really tight knit community and everybody loves each other. And, you know, that's great. And, and then you have, you know, you have 19 kids lying bleeding out dead on the floor and the police are afraid to go in the, the classroom, you know? So again, you have to have some controls over these things. And so we're going to talk about, but I also think a lot of these people, they're not aware of these lawsuits and these fines and things like that. And the liability, I mean, one of these, one of these billion dollar lawsuits can close a company completely down and it happens. And also these are required by the federal government. So not doing them is a felony. It's not a misdemeanor. It's not a, gee, I'm sorry, I did that. I didn't know it's required. And CMS does that and OSHA does that. They're both federal agencies. Of course, the workplace violence, as you can see, isn't slowing down at all. And even though I, I must get five articles in the mail in my email every single day about workplace violence, it still occurs more frequently today than it did five years ago or 10 years ago. And so we need some kind of interventions to slow these rates down. And I think we need to make people aware of how dangerous it is, too, because I think part of the thing with uh, healthcare worker burnout is that everybody's telling them what a great job they're doing. Everybody's telling them how important it is and they're suffering every single day. They're still getting hit. I had to, you know, make an appointment in advance to go do a risk assessment for somebody, or I can even do a, I have a special program now to do a one day active shooter risk assessment, which looks at a little different things than it does that CMS looks at. But again, how common is it? OSHA said it's more dangerous than working on a high-rise building or working on a telephone pole. It's more dangerous to work in an emergency room than it is up in the air on a telephone. And seven of 10 physicians have said that violence is increasing and that it's affecting patient care. And this is from the American College of Emergency Physicians. Department of Health and Human Services also had the largest healthcare privacy record for settlements and enforcement of the law. I'm sorry about the typos here. I was trying to get it done in time obviously unsuccessfully. And in 2018, the Office of Civil Rights settled 10 cases and secured a judgment, a $28 million judgment in fines for healthcare providers and healthcare related companies, violations of HIPAA, 22% higher than the previous record of 23.5 million in 2016. And this was part of the huge HIPAA settlement that they had with Anthem. $16 million insurer agreed to pay the settlement in October for a breach that affected almost 80 million customers. So why is this still happening? It's, and these are what I, I talking to people, what we came up with. First security is still an afterthought. It's not something that people want to talk about. They want to talk about how many beds are filled and they want to talk about the state of healthcare in their community and all these other COVID and monkeypox, it's it's a, it's not top of mind. It's an afterthought. It's boring, you know? It's also an expense item on their balance sheet. So when the CEO or the CFO goes in to brief the board on what's happening and they have like the Cleveland Clinic had the first quarter a $90 mil, billion dollar loss, you know, there's where did that money come from and where how we're going to make it up? We'll just cut the security budget, you know? That makes a lot of sense. Also, security is still following this law enforcement model where you go in and find the per, this law enforcement model is somebody does something bad, you go in and you find them, investigate, find out who they are, and then turn them over to the justice system. So then they go to court or they go to prison or wherever they go. And also people aren't aware because of this artificial separation between physical or facility security and technology, they don't realize how the the, IT, the artificial intelligence is now embedded in these, these uh, products that are coming out, the cameras, the access control cards, the, the weapon screening systems, all these are huge. So these are just some of the worst ones. We had this whole raft of them between May 15th, this is when it started, and going right through August. And this 
this was a Geneva Presbyterian church shooting where the, the shooter was Chinese. And this church in Orange County, California is uh, mostly Taiwanese. And he hates the Taiwanese people because they don't want to be part of China. He, he went to the service armed with a, a glue gun, a uh, uh, super glue, and also a nail gun fully loaded. And he glued the church door shut. Then he nailed them shut over the glue. And then he chained them with a big chain with a padlock on it. And then the shooter snuck around the back and went into the synagogue and shot, not synagogue, the church, shot 10 senior citizens aged 75 to 90. They only had 43 people in the congregation. A doctor who had driven his mother to church that morning hit the shooter with a chair and stopped him. And then everybody piled on and took his weapon away from him. And he waited till the police got there but not before he got a shot off and killed the doctor too. Then we have the Uvalde school shooting, which we talked about already. And then, then right at, these are in chronological order, by the way. Then we have the Tulsa shooting. Now we've gone, so we've gone two weeks now. We have the June 2nd Tulsa shooting. This was on the St. The Natalie building of the St. Francis Health System campus. And you can see it. He and the, the, the guy here was operated on for back problems with orthopedic doctor, told him he wasn't going to give him the pain meds he wants. He targeted Dr. Preston Phillips, a surgeon who'd operated on him. As soon as he re the, the shooter was released from the hospital on May 24th, this is June 2nd, at two o'clock on the same day, he purchased an assault rifle from a local gun store and took it to the hospital along with the 40 caliber Smith & Wesson semi-automatic handgun he'd also bought. And then he went in, he shot the receptionist, he shot a bystander, killed him. And then he shot another doctor, a female doctor, and killed her. And then he shot his own doctor he found up on the second floor. And what could have prevented this? absolutely nothing. They had no security. They had no, they had a security company that worked for the whole campus, mainly for the St. Francis Medical Center there that got the majority of attention from the security. They had nobody in the lobby. The, he shot the reception, or shot and killed the receptionist and the doctor. He went up to the second floor unimpeded. He was able to walk right in and go right to the elevator and go anywhere in the building he wanted to go and shot this surgeon who was supposed to be the very best one in Texas and really, really good person too. I'm sorry, Oklahoma. And so that's what, the, the, so that was June 2nd. This is June 3rd. So the, this was a doctor and two nurses stabbed at the Encino Hospital Medical Center, which Encino is a big suburb of Los Angeles in Los Angeles County. So this man comes in all sweaty and crazy parks his car in the middle of the street, doesn't even park it. He just leaves it in the middle of the street, runs in the hospital with his dog on a leash and barricades himself. He grabs a knife, stabs a, a doctor and two nurses, and then he locks, it, locks them in the emergency room with him while the SWAT team is called in to try to negotiate with him. And of course, they didn't get anywhere. There are three victims that were taken to trauma center once they managed to force the doors open and get him out. One was in critical condition. All three were taken to Dignity Health Northridge Medical Center and the attacker's name wasn't released. But he had a, they said he had a lengthy cr criminal record, including two arrests this year for battery of a police officer and resisting arrest. An ultrasound technician, Benjamin Roman was there. He told the radio station that the guy had a dog with him and he thought he was high on drugs because his pupils were dilated he was drenched in sweat and he told him he was having anxiety problems. So he wanted to get some, uh, wanted to get some medicine for his anxiety problems. So what could have prevented that? Concealed weapons screening to enter the building? Absolutely. You know, it's the only thing that would have helped. Panic alarms? No, it's too late. Live receptionist? No, he just shot the receptionist. Security officer present? No. Policies and procedures? No. Faster police response? No. Police were right there on campus. They were there in one minute. It was already done by that time. They had already, they had already run upstairs and killed the people. This is the next one. This is, that was June 2nd, 3rd, now we're June 17th. 71-year-old active shooter fires on Vestavia Hills Episcopal Church potluck dinner called the Baby Boomers Potluck Dinner in Alabama, killing two and injuring one. This guy went to this church, which had never been there before. Nobody knew who he was. Nobody knew why he started shooting. But as soon as dinner was over, he sat down on a table and ate with these people. And then as soon as dinner was over, he got his gun out and started shooting. He killed two that night and injured a third person and that person died. So he killed three people that night and still people have no idea what his motive was. Security and safety, when you talk to management about them, they think that's really boring and it sounds expensive. So what you got to talk about is compliance and liability and what these fines are and the, what the impact is of that CMS rule, final, final rule on emergency preparedness and the OSHA general duty clause, which we're going to look at in a minute. It requires every employer, even if you have only one employee, to maintain a safe environment free of recognized threats. They also have to do a worksite analysis, just like you have to do a risk analysis. It's the same thing, basically. You have to show what the threats are and how you're going to counteract them.
And we just got approved the OSHA federal standard for workplace violence, OSHA 3148, specifically for healthcare and social service workers. The new house, the new bill, so it specifically refers to this guidelines document, which I'll send you along with my note after the webinar is over, the guidelines for preventing workplace violence. Uh, Senator Tammy Baldwin introduced the bill. It had already passed the House a year earlier, but now it, it pa finally passed the Senate bill with a lot of support from National Nurses Union, Nurses United, and it requires them to the OSHA to create a federal standard mandating health care and social service employers to create and implement a workplace violence prevention plan. And so now they both passed it. So it's in reconciliation now. It has 26 bipartisan co-sponsors. So finally, we're going to have the federal legislation for this. And so what do you do to prevent this from happening where you are? So these are my bullet points on how to prevent something from happening wherever you are. Number one, it's got to, it's always access. A is for access control. You have to have access control. And that means that the doors aren't propped open. And it means that all the doors that can be locked are locked. And the ones that don't have locks, you need to get locks for. It means you need to install and put in an enforced entry uh, concealed weapon screening program. And we're going to talk about that in a little while because this is what's going to save you. And in fact, it's going to save you because the Cleveland Clinic, the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic, they put a concealed weapon detection system in their three hospitals. And I worked with them. I've been to all three of those hospitals in Northern Ohio. How many weapons do you think they got in three months they got 30,000 weapons so if they got 30,000 weapons and they run a pretty tight ship think about how many weapons are coming in through your your hospital in the front or in the back or in the side or in, wherever you are it's just un, you would not believe the amount of weapons that are coming in through these buildings in fact I went I did some work for uh, Durham County North Carolina for the county on HIPAA and some other security things and went to the Criminal Justice Institute which is right near the courthouse there and I went in and they had like a knife garden in the front outside the building in between the shrubs and things 500 knives because they have to go in the front door and then they go right into the metal detector so everybody takes their knife out and throws it in the bushes so anytime you need a letter opener they said we just go out and grab one of these knives and 500 knives sitting in the ground outside there outside of the of the lobby unbelievable and it's only when you start and that's what the people at athena who who do this concealed weapon screening that who invented the solution because they already were working in artificial intelligence they sold their first company and cashed out and they started the athena security company to build this entryway product keep people from being completely deluged with weapons and people ready to attack at any moment so the next thing is to have people use the most current policies and procedures which always doesn't happen secure the windows and doors and the first thing should be on top annual security risk assessment cms rule applies to this and you can be fined and you can lose the privilege of having cms re reimburse all your medical procedures that's the other thing that happens there's that federal exclusion agreement there that says that you're never going to be you personally are never going to be allowed to be a CEO or a C-level of any hospital. And any hospital that you work in will never receive CMS, CMS money again. So a, that's the biggest hammer I've ever heard of, cutting off the reimbursements for the, the, the care. And of course, the general duty clause. This is the report that came out after the Uvalde school shooting. It's a 77-page report. Pages 1 through 70 explain all the things that happened and how bad they were. Pages 71 to 77 are all the solutions that they thought that they would have to implement. This came out again the same period following through all things that happened in june and now we're into july this is the report in case you want to look at it yourself this is a copy of the report in this man's hand that's his daughter who was killed in the shooting and these are all the kind of controls that i would go in and ask a facility do you have this do you have access control for all doors and people say yes and then i do a night night lighting survey and i go around the back of the hospital and i find four doors propped open because the people who are working back in the cafeteria they want to they want to be able to go outside and smoke a cigarette and not have to come around the front entry again which i would i'm definitely going to make them do that but it even impacted the cafeteria at one big hospital i went to in downtown los angeles so bad that when i first showed up there on monday morning at nine o'clock to do the risk assessment is there a cafeteria around here where you get some coffee and they go no it's closed why is it closed we had a rat invasion that's what they told me they had a rat invasion they propped the doors open downstairs in the hospital so often 
and the rats just saw a giant neon sign saying food being prepared here. They had so many rats. They had them in the food. They had them in every single cabinet. They had them in the pots, you know, the place where the, they store the pots all, everywhere. And it was take more than a week to get rid of all the rats. And I just wonder how many people would want to go to a hospital that was having a, a rat invasion. So we need, we need to get have access control systems for all the doors and have the doors closed, not propped open. Areas of refuge, you know, this used to be a big deal. You know, can I hide in there and stay away from an active shooter? No, you can't. I would completely eliminate this control as valuable because we saw in the Pulse nightclub shooting, everybody ran into an area of refuge, which was the bathroom, tile bathroom, no windows. And what happened? The guy broke the door down and just, they were lined up inside hiding in the toilet, the toilet cubicles, and he just shot everyone, just like in Sandy Hook, just stood there like shooting fish in a barrel. I personally, I'm a big animal lover, so I hate that expression. Uh, bollards and posts and barriers at the front entries. You know, we've seen, in, and maybe it's because I live in retarded Florida, but I've seen cars wedged between the front doors of the hospital where they have the pretty columns, had a Toyota wedged in there at an ambulatory surgery center, uh, have people who are 80 years old and they're still driving. And this guy, you know, is going to go make, go make a turn around the corner and, and crashes right into the side of the building. One side of a building has been hit five times. They had to completely redo that 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 part of the building. It had been run into by 85-year-old men delivering their wives to surgery that many times. Camera systems, of course, but camera systems that are accessible, that are on the reception desk so that the person sitting there can see what's happening in the parking lot. And again, this is some. And the other thing I get is, well, we have camera system. Well, where are the screen monitoring screens? Well, they're locked up in the IT closet. Do you have a key? No, the only guy who has a key is the IT director, and he's on vacation this week. So all that camera footage they're collecting, I mean, it might be nice in court later, but it's not going to help them get out of a situation right now. The only thing that's going to make a difference here, again, is a concealed weapons detection screening. Keeps the weapons out of the hospital so it can't hurt anybody. You know, we go through the Uvalde thing. It's the worst example of security I've ever seen. This started with, a, we're such a close-knit community and everybody loves everybody, so it could never happen here until it did, that not updating their policies and procedures, not being notified that the calls were coming from inside the school, the children, eight, nine, 10 year old kids who were shot had the phones now. They didn't have them in Sandy Hook. Now they have phones to call dispatch and say, please, please send somebody in to rescue us. 376 people were outside of the door to their classroom and didn't come in. Didn't allow the first responders to come in either. And so the kids bled out on the floor. If the same thing in Parkland. They kept the, they were afraid, so they kept the first responders in their cars with their guns drawn, but they didn't allow them to enter the facility. In fact, they're going to tear it down now after four years, and it's still got the blood on the floor, the kids' backpacks, they, they locked it up. They got all the bodies out, got all the humans out that day, and it's been locked up ever since in the Florida heat because they couldn't get the money to knock it down, but I guess they got it now, so that'll be good. And again, for a lot of these things we're talking about, you know, if I did a night lighting survey at your facility, I might find a lot of these same things. The door's propped open so it can get the breeze at night, all these things. Nothing's going to change unless there's accountability for this. You know, the, the management gets a huge fine, but the people who do these things, like prop a door open, they don't think it has consequences, but it has enormous consequences. In fact, the backdoor entry happens in most of these cases. So we have to start changing the policy to be, you get three months off without pay if, if you prop open a door. There has to be accountability, has to be consequences. This is some of the things that, you know, they talked about everything that was wrong, you know, and I'm going to skip over this because we have more recent things to talk about. But basically, these kind of healthcare attacks that we're talking about all these months are, are very, very, they're violent, they're getting worse. It's hard to get a restraining order against a patient. But because it comes at the last minute, but you get a constant challenge of assessing the patients for threats, not something people should be doing. And I wrote an article about this coming out next month in the Journal of Healthcare Protection. And it's this is some of the quotes that I got. The Minnesota Nurses Association, violence in healthcare settings happens every day on every shift and in all units of the hospital. In fact, the day they had this really bad uh, shooting at Alina Hospital where the guy brought his own explosives his own bombs that he created in the Motel 6 kitchen it says that 95% of the nurses don't feel safe from violence at work. And it just, it just keeps going and going and going. One patient threatened to shoot Dr. Terry Hunt at the Mayo Clinic if the, if the physical therapy didn't relieve his pain as well as the opioids did. So now doctors are target for violence if they re refuse to prescribe the pain meds, which I think was behind the Tulsa shooting too. Another staff went out looking for that doctor so they could punish him, get him to do something. He was 
un, unharmed, but shaken enough to ask the central hospital system where he worked to dismiss those patients permanently so they can never come back. And then he said when he heard about the attack at the medical clinic in Buffalo, Minnesota, at the Alina clinic a year ago that left one dead and four injured, first thing I, I assumed he said it was something to do with pain medication. So he said it makes us ask about our own workplace. How secure are we? And I bet you're not as secure as you think you are. So that uh, brings me to the point about having access control systems and concealed weapons detection screening. It's very affordable. In fact, they have special rates just for hospitals. And you could even be a pilot project and try it out for three months if you want. They'll come, they'll set it up, they'll do the whole thing for you, set it all, and it'll run itself. And the people that I hear back most are from people who started up for the first time because they can't believe how many weapons they're finding. Almost every person seems is carrying a gun or a knife somewhere. And then you can take those results and you can show them to your board. It also cuts down on the cost of security officer requirements because it makes a decision where to sound the alarm or not. So you don't have somebody sitting there watching. You don't have somebody, you know, patting people down with a with a handheld metal detector. And again, this was a methodology that I worked on in 1998 for the Defense Department to come out with a high value, something to protect high value critical assets. And it's currently required by the assessments for Homeland Security, the uh, federal, FEMA, Department of Defense, and every level of government, state, local, federal, county, they all require these kind of assessments. We also, it comes up with a return on investment at the end that tells you how much you have to do, how much it's going to cost, and how much it's going to save you. A, a, a defined quantitative cost-benefit analysis, which is the Defense Department made it a requirement. So again, this is the thing that we go through is updating the threats, looking at how much the assets, how critical they are, how long you could do without them, and how long they would take to replace it, present-day replacement value. Like in Oklahoma City, for example, it was... The 30% of the building was destroyed. When we calculated that out, you don't calculate it based on what it costs 10 years ago when it was built to put that in. It costs, you do it present day replacement value. It's four times, so more, more value, four times more valuable than it was back then. Then we sit down and talk to the staff and measure their compliance and awareness of all these issues. We can do it online. We can do it in person. We can do it on the phone. Then we rate the implementation of the controls that you have in place. And I used to have 64 controls for a hospital. Now I'm condensing it down. Because unless you have the, the weapon screening, you really don't have anything. You're just going to continue to have these same problems over and over again. And then we have to prepare action reports based on return on investment for a board member to understand. Because what happens is I put a, I, when I do an assessment, I give you a cover page that says that I assessed this and it met all these requirements and da 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 da. They want to know when the regulators come back in, they see that and they go, okay, because they call me instead of the hospital. And they say, okay, how are we going to do this? And I'll say, well, the board approved this plan, blah, blah, blah. I'll say, okay, show us where it, where it said that was approved. They actually want me to go through the, they have, I have to go get the board minutes and I have to look at the board minutes and I have to figure out, you know, how much these things cost. It's an unbelievable amount of work to do that, but we do it, you know? So I'm glad to see some other friends like Craig have joined us. That's a good thing. So then we update all our emergency plans, uh, anything that's changed. And we, we have to come up with an emergency plan to address it. And again, this is something you can show management. The lack of security is not a legal argument. So McDonald's was lost a lawsuit, $27 million dollars after two teenagers died in a fight in their parking lot. And one of the things that was uh, consequential about this was they asked, they called the police department and said, how many times have you been called to this McDonald's location in the last year? They've been called a hundred times. Uh, U.S. Security Associates in downtown Philadelphia, the Cracker, Craft Cracker Factory, where they make manufacturing plant, where they make, they make what, goldfish crackers. They weren't smiling back when they got a $64 million loss and lost the lawsuit. And then, again, this was a termination problem where they terminated this lady and uh, she went back and she got, got the car Glock out of the car after they terminated her. And the, the security officer saw her coming back into the building and they locked themselves into the cast iron boiler. And she went and killed the three people who had uh, fired her. Stanford Health sued for $82 million after a woman finished her cardiac rehab in the rehab center. She stepped on, 80 years old, stepped on the gas instead of the brake. And as she went the 61 feet into the facility, she ran over and killed the department of Lawrence, the director of Lawrence Livermore Labs, which is a big energy lab in Northern California. And they lost the lawsuit. Same thing, Del Nor Hospital Settlement. Four nurses received 
$4.8 million for being traumatized and raped by a patient who ate his croc sandal to be admitted to the, ho to the hospital because he knew that it was easier to escape from a hospital than it was a maximum security prison. This also affects reputation loss, state funding, costs millions of dollars in liability if an incident occurs. And so the risk assessment part of it done up front actually protects you. It makes a business case for having this additional screening, can insulate you from fines, state government fines and things like that. So we can do really high return on investment for these concealed weapons detection system. And again, very inexpensive and almost a required. This is our cycle. So what you do this every year, you do the assessment, you see what you need to fix, you get the controls in place to reduce the risk and the threat. And then next year you do it again. So some places I've done the, all the risk assessments for five years and you can see them go down year after year. The threat goes down, the controls go up, you have more training, people understand more and it just, it's a beautiful thing. It just makes it every year you get safer and that's a wonderful thing too. So we just get all this threat information that we talked about, aggregate it together, how to average it out and everything. And so that's why I rec one of the things that I recommend is before you spend one more dollar on training or anything else, you need to get this entryway screening solution to keep guns and knives out. It integrates with RFID tags, so it identifies people instantly if they're part of the organization. Three to 4,000 people an hour can walk through it. It can lock the doors. It can lock the lobby down so nobody can get out. If it turns out to alarm on something, you can see the alerts on your phone if you're not there. And again, it's it, because it uses a higher level of artificial intelligence even looking at things that are ferrous and non-ferrous metals, aluminum, all these different things. And you don't have to take out your cell phone, your keys, your watch. You don't have to take, you see men taking their belt buckles off at the airport. You don't have to do that. You don't have to x-ray. It doesn't go through a belt like it does a scanner at the airport. And you see the lady poking around in there trying to see if they have anything. She can't really see. If you have a, your, your labels laid out in a layer of aluminum foil in between, I'm not going to see anything. But again, this is the need to take, is this, these are 20 year old metal detectors. And they're nothing like the ones that they have now. And so this one is fast, easy. You don't have to take anything out. Standalone or networked, highest throughput, highest accuracy. We've done a million, and it's the only one that meets the federal standard from the National Institute of Justice. This kind, this is the US Department of Justice. And this is law enforcement and corrections on the testing program. This is a standard NIJ 601.02, that metal and scanning automatically for these different things. So this is what it looks like when you walk through. You can come in, you can have your headphones on, you can have your backpack on your back with your cell phone in it and everything else. It's not going to alarm on that. It's only going to alarm if you have these certain concentrations of certain kinds of metal. It's collect. So these are the posts, the two posts that you can pick up and put and deliver in your car and they get all set up. You can use them networked or standalone and they're going to analyze everything that is in there to see if it meets any of these weapon profiles. It's going to commute, communicate that directly to the screen here. It's going to take in all the data and analyze it. And it's only going to go off if you if you have something. Again, we look at the state of all these controls. We analyze all the stuff by return on investment. The bottom line is we guarantee compliance and it reduces liability. I want to prevent active shooter incidents before they happen. And before the next webinar, I'm going to get that video of Deja Vu, that movie with Denzel Washington in uh, New Orleans, where he says, you know, all my life I've tried to you know, figure out why these things happen. He said, just once in my life, I'd like to stop something before it happens. That's where I am right now. I'm going to stop something before it happens. Talk to management about what you need to secure your facility. Have them look at this video. If you don't like it, have them talk, call me and talk to me. We'll have a three-way discussion on why they need it. And they can do a free pilot anyway and not have to worry about it. If they don't like it, they don't use it. But first day that you get 20 weapons or 60 weapons or whatever it is, you're going to be a believer like I am. So again, in court, lack of security is not considered an effective legal argument. So you have to start by analyzing your current access control systems, checking on those doors, and using a concealed weapon screening system. So it's going to give you the best bang for the buck. You can write me for more in detailed information on anything that you want at carolinariskandsecurity.llc. Here's my email address again. And this is Michael Green. He's a CEO of Athena Security. I'm just, they're sponsoring me. So that means that they help pay for the cost of putting these things together because they believe in it. I, and I really enjoyed working with them. At, and then they ask for design help and they want to meet people, you know, and they're starting to go to the shows and things like that because they want to make it the way you want it 
and so you can also write to Michael to ask him about a pilot or if you want to have a demo, they'll actually go to your site and have a demo. And they just got some huge clients, including uh, Kaiser Permanente. So that's a really good thing. I'm hanging out here in Parkland for the duration. And I want to thank you very much for coming today. And I hope you have a fantastic day. Bye-bye.